Happy May Day. I'm Kathy Nelson, Senior Vice President of Philanthropy at the Hawaii Community Foundation. And I wanna thank you for joining us today for Dr. Carl Bonham's presentation, Reopening and Recovery, Hawaii's Prospects and Challenges. We invited you to this briefing because of your support for our communities through HCF. You are the reason HCF is able to get funds to the organizations that are serving those who need help more now than ever before. We're really, really grateful for that. Before we get to Dr. Bonham, our president and CEO, Mike Akane, will talk about the Hawaii Resilience Fund in Action, the landscape of COVID-19, and Michelle Kauhane, our Senior Vice President of Community Grants and Initiatives, will go over HCF's approach to grant making dur during times of disaster. Just a reminder that if you have questions, please use the chat box at the bottom of your screen to ask them. We'll be answering questions after Dr. Bonham's presentation. Now it's my pleasure to welcome Micah Kane. Thank you, Kathy. And uh, first off, I wanna thank everyone for being with us today. I really appreciate you taking the time. I wanna real briefly recognize our board members who are on the call. We have a lot of people on this call, but I wanna recognize our board. Peter Ho, our chair, Jeff Arce, Alan Arizumi, Mary Bitterman, coming at us from San Francisco, Mike Broderick, Bob Harrison, Paul Kosasa, Elliot Mills, Kathy Richardson from Kauai, Jennifer Sebast, and Leah Sheehan. Thank you all for your support and leadership, and thank you for being on the call. I also want to thank you uh, for your generous support. Our community um, is really feeling the impact of your generosity. We're putting that money to work uh, very quickly, and uh, we really, really appreciate it. I have started to call this period, um, really it was a sprint to sprint to the curve and now it's a, it's a marathon. And um, you know, before we bring up Dr. Bonham, I wanna bring up an infographic because there's so many ways to look at this COVID-19 period. I'm just gonna take a few minutes to try to orient ourselves around a, a common lens by which we uh, view Hawaii. Um, I'd like you to, to focus on the top half of this infographic, and it's really uh, HCF's lens of how we view Hawaii's COVID story. And there are seven key elements to the top half of this infographic. Um, first, the shaded curve, which is our projected estimates on the number of hospitalizations that we would have expected over the 60 day period, those two months. The second um, key element is the dark bold line, which is the actual hospitalization. Those are two very important uh, correlations that um, we were monitoring. There were also five um, either events or interventions that were critical to our decision-making processes. Um, the first, which was um, on March 8th, which was our first case in Hawaii. The second was on March 10th, which was when the uh, hotspots started to erupt in Seattle and New York. The third was an intervention, uh, which was the closure of our school system on March 19th. And then the stay-at-home order on March 25th and then the mandatory quarantining of all incoming visitors on March 26. I think what we want you to really focus on is the quarantining period that really started um, and then the correlation to the curve. And you'll see within that 10 day period of the intervention taking place, you see immediate drop in hospitalizations occurring and then the flatness of that curve going forward. So that picture we felt was very important and the correlation of those events um, was very important. So the events that occurred um, and the correlation to the curve. I also wanna put light on Hawaii Community Foundation's Hawaii Resilience Fund launch on March 18th. Uh, we hit a $5 million mark, thanks to many of you on this call on April 1st. At that point, already uh, about 3.3 million hit our nonprofit market and was executing um, already. And Michelle's gonna talk a little bit more about that before Dr. Bonham comes on. And then on April 14th, we hit the $10 million curve. And uh, to date, we've put about $5.5 .5 million uh, into the community to, to address this situation. On the lower half 
um, are five panels, and I'm just going to hit them very briefly. Um, for every intervention, um, there are consequences, and we try to highlight those consequences. And then we try to highlight the mitigants that need to address those consequences. And then finally, who's going to step up? If you look at the far right hand side, um, the intervention there was mandatory quarantining. The consequence was uh, 250,000 of our people becoming unemployed. The mitigant was prepaid unemployment benefits along with emergency grants and financial assistance and emergency food assistance by HCF. And then we list those who are responsible for stepping up and delivering those services. You know, that is the type of thinking um, and muscle that we're going to have to develop as a community as we start bringing on more interventions in, into our, our model. And, and the better we can start to forecast the consequences, the better we can start developing uh, mitigants to those, those issues. The last statement uh, I want to make before I ask Michelle to cover briefly uh, our grant making strategy is that there is going to be a direct correlation between the degree by which we welcome the limitations of our social liberties that we've become very accustomed to pre-COVID to um, the acceleration that we hope to see in our economy coming back. And so when you're listening to Dr. Bonham and he's starting to talk about bringing the economy back and what it's going to take in our current situation, we all need to start to digest, um, you know, what that new normal is going to look like for us as it relates to our social, social liberties that, again, that we've been accustomed to and how we're going to have to function differently in order for us to keep that curve compressed. Because there's definitely a direct correlation um, to those activities um, and, and keeping that curve flat. So with that said, again, I want to thank you all for being with us. I'm going to turn the mic over to Michelle Kauhane, who is our senior VP of Grants and uh, Community Investment. She's just going to take a couple minutes to talk briefly about our grant making strategy, and then she's going to turn it over to Dr. Bonham. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Micah. Um, my goal is really to share with you all the strategy that the Community Foundation follows in terms grant making through the Hawaii Resilience Fund. Following the Kauai floods and the volcano recovery efforts that happened last year, uh, we did a, a strategic planning through the change framework to better understand how would we would respond in any uh, emergency situation. And so today we arrive at COVID-19 and we're following a four phase process on the way we get grants and dollars out to the community to support those needs in the community. Um, phase one is focused on risk reduction and readiness. And really what that meant for COVID was that we were increasing the testing. We were supporting quarantine and isolation uh, units. We were focused on vulnerable populations that if infected would be hit the hardest. Uh, in risk reduction and readiness, our aim was to flatten that curve. Uh, we made grants in the area of about $2.4 million in phase one. Phase two, uh, we focus on rapid relief and response. We've made about $3.3 million in grants to address economic consequences of coronavirus. Uh, prior to this, our change framework was highlighting the inequities among specific groups of people or in various demographics or locations in Hawaii uh, with a focus on ALICE. And so our strategy has been to get emergency grants through statewide providers to families as they await their unemployment or stimulus check benefits. We see our right between phase two and phase three. Uh, phase three is really around uh, recovery and stabilization, and we'll talk a little bit more about that development financial institutions who will help us deploy uh, capital to small businesses, to nonprofits, and to individuals struggling and have uh, lack of access to mainstream financing. We know that's one recovery um, strategy that we have, but we're also doing a lot of outreach and community to get feedback from nonprofits and small businesses about what recovery is going to look like for them. And then, of course, the final stage on rebuilding resilience, 
convening with leaders and communities to talk and learn, refining our existing um, plans and making sure that we are always resilient and ready for the next disaster because we know it's not an if but a when situation. And so that's part of the cycle that we go through. Um, with that being said, uh, welcome Dr. Bonham. I just want to remind you uh, that I will be facilitating some questions, moderating questions at the end of the session after his comments. You can submit your questions in the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, we will try to get to as many of those as possible. We did get some questions ahead of time, so I thank those of you, uh, on the call who actually submitted those. And so it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Carl Bonham, Executive Director of the University of Hawaii Economic Research Organization, also referred to as UHERO. Welcome, Doctor. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Thanks, uh, Micah, for the introduction and the opportunity to, to speak today. Um, I'm, I'm going to give a real brief overview of UHERO, just for those of you who, who may not know about some of the, the background. We, we've, we were formed in 1997 by a small group of, uh, of economists uh, at UH Manoa. Um, our mission at the time, and we've, we've maintained exactly the same mission uh, over the 20 plus years that we've been, uh, been in operation, has been to conduct rigorous and independent research on the issues that are critical to Hawaii's future uh, and also globally relevant. And so um, while we began primarily focused on forecasting because that was sort of my, my interest and Dr. Byron Gangness's interest at two founding members, as we have um, been able to build up support from uh, men, much, many, many people in the community, including many of you on this call, uh, but also from the university and from, from the state, uh, we've been able to add significant capacity in a, in a wide variety of areas from analytics to energy, uh, natural resource management and environmental uh, planning and policy is a, is a core strength of ours. Obviously, we're still, we're still, we're still doing the forecast work. Um, and we, we received a very generous contribution from the Hawaii Community Reinve Reinvestment Corporation several years back and, and many other uh, donors as well, nonprofits and uh, others in the community that allowed us to establish an endowed share in housing with a focus on affordable housing. And hopefully over the next 20 years, we'll be adding many more focus areas to our, to our mission. During the crisis, I, I've really been just, just completely astounded at the, the effort and the, um, the compassion of our team to rapidly produce uh, new analytics products from our high frequency dashboard. Uh, we've rolled out three forecast reports in a month. Um, we've got another one that we'll be coming out with in, the, in a few short weeks, uh, a, a wide array of, of policy briefs and blogs. We released one on, uh, I think on Wednesday about um, remaking and uh, rebuilding tourism by Jim Mack and Frank Haas. And then yesterday, Phil Garboden, our housing uh, chair, released a, a piece on uh, protecting, uh, dealing with the, the crisis in housing and renters. Um, and of course, we're all doing as, as much service as we can. Um, the just get right into the forecast. Um, actually, much of this, you know, there's so much uncertainty in, in the environment today that uh, much of what we're really doing is scenario planning. Um, the, the way that we do our forecast work, we have a whole team Myself, Peter Falecki, who's part-time with, with econ, and Byron Gangness, who's a full-time econ faculty. Um, we have three graduate students that uh, are, are working on this project all the time. In fact, they do a lot of the initial writing, so we're doing, um, doing a lot of training that uh, prepares, prepares them for, uh, for their future careers. We actually have uh, two to three undergraduate interns who work on this all the time. And it, it really is a team effort. Byron and Peter lead the, the sort of uh, international focus of the forecast. And we always start with a, a US, a Japan, a rest of the world forecast. And you know, right now that, that forecast for the US is, is pretty bleak. Um, first quarter of the year, the data came in 
about where we were expecting. We, we think it'll actually be a little bit worse than, than the 5% down. So this is, these numbers are real GDP growth for the United States. So we think the first quarter is going to be about minus five and the second quarter is going to be closer to minus 30. Uh, you know, the, the subtitle here says we could have a quick recovery and we're expecting a relatively quick recovery. We actually have for the whole year about a four and a half percent drop. Uh, that quick recovery depends on policy and that's part of the uncertainty we face. It's not only the epidemiology, right? It's not only how, how long the, the uh, virus continues to spread, but it's the policy response, the stay at home orders. Are they going to be relaxed too early in some parts of the world or some parts of the country? and result in, in sort of rolling outbreaks. Um, the, we've seen some, some solid policy response out of the federal government. We're still lacking in a national policy for testing. Uh, that's a, a, a very critical component. Uh, and we're going to need additional support from the federal government for states and counties that we haven't seen yet. And so all of these things introduced tremendous amount of uncertainty. The, one of the things that we're watching quite closely is consumer attitudes. The U.S., uh, excuse me, the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Index had its largest one-month drop on record. Uh, the, the primary cause of that was the current conditions component of that index. Uh, and actually, if you, if you look at the current conditions index, it fell about twice as much as it did during the onset of the financial crisis in 2008. The forward-looking index isn't as bleak. Uh, it actually hasn't set a, a new record. Uh, and so that's what we'll be watching in, in May, right? We've got the April data, May data will actually start coming in in a couple of weeks. And it will be very telling to see how, what consumers are saying about their forward looking expectations as they begin to observe, you know, they have more information on the, you know, the size of the un unemployment increases and they have more information on the effects of the lockdowns or the, the shelter in place and then begin to see the, the reopening. And, the, the next step really is um, information on consumer attitudes about travel, right? So this gives us information on consumer attitudes about uh, spending going forward. A big question for Hawaii over the next year is consumer attitudes about air travel in particular. And we're, we're gathering that kind of information from, uh, from various sources. The, what's happened in Hawaii is, is really a sudden stop of economic activity. So it's very different than a normal recession uh, where you know, there, there's a, the surge in oil prices or, or a spike in inflation or a spike in interest rates that causes people to cut back on demand. This is a shutting down of tourism. Um, actually the, the, the shelter in place and the shutting down of the local economy happened first, but we had begun to see the decline in passenger counts. This is a seven day moving average of passenger counts on our high frequency dashboard. And you know you, you can see that they were declining quite precipitously uh, in the first part of May, I'm sorry, in the first part of March, but then, and then essentially hit zero with the 14 day quarantine compared to, to last year's levels that are around 30,000 um, people arriving every single day. And so we have that sudden stop in tourism, but we also have a sudden stop that comes from the stay at home order. And this is really kind of a combination because this is a visualization, uh, we call it the Hawaii Jobs Explorer. And each of these little squares over here is a different, a different occupation. Here we're focusing on food service providers. There were 85,000 food prep and service related occupations in Hawaii in 2019. And many of these have, have obviously been laid off. And this is a combination of uh, the closures of bars and restaurants that happened even before the 14-day the quarantine, but it's also obviously greatly impacted by the fact that there aren't any, uh, any real number of visitors in the state. And so while some of the chefs and cooks and, um, may still have work because of the, the home delivery and the food prep that's going on to help the needy, the you know, bartenders are out of work and so on. And so we're using that occupation level data to help inform us about where some of these job losses are occurring. And this is actually new data that has the um, initial unemployment claims all the way through the 25th of April. So we now have 
hard data on the processed unemployment claims uh, that comes to 200,000 jobs lost in March and April. Um, we're, so the, the problem with this data, or one of the, the, it's not a problem with the data, it's just unavailability of industry level detail. So in this unemployment insurance data, we don't have any information on what type of jobs were lost. Obviously, we know that, that bartenders and accommodation shops were lost, but to deal with that, we, Phil Garboden and uh, some of the rest of our team worked with the Chamber of Commerce Hawaii, and actually we got great support from uh, the chambers on all the islands, other, the Restaurant Association, other uh, Food Industry Association, many others helped us to quickly ramp up this survey and we got over 600 responses in roughly a week, uh, cleaned the data, reweighted it to match it up with the overall economy. And we came up with, from that survey, a 220,000 loss of jobs, part-time and full-time from January to April. And so we're using that number as our benchmark for sort of where the bottom is right now. Um, uh, you know, you, you, you get exactly what you would expect. The hardest hit areas are in accommodations where essentially it's all tourism and you've got 83% uh, reported job loss, uh, accommodations, retail, arts, entertainments and, arts, entertainment and recreation all hit in the 75 to 85% reduction in employment, food service, educational services, one that you, you, know, you might not think of right away. These are private sector education jobs. Uh, so think about after school care, um, support services in DOE, private schools, uh, you know, that have been shut down since mid-March. Uh, and, and so a big job loss is there, 50 to 60%. One of the other things that's really important about the surveys, it tells us that the people most likely to have been affected are the least able to uh, to sort of, you know, have had assets. Basically, Alice families, uh, if you were a part-time worker, you were more likely to lose a job than a full-time. If you were a relatively low-income worker, you were much more likely to lose a job than a high, higher-paid worker. The good news is, and it's important to point out that there is some good news, is that uh, Sixty percent of the businesses reported that when it's safe to do so, they would be able to bring back most of their employees relatively quickly, reopen, and then gradually as the economy gains some steam and as we eventually bring tourists back to the state, they would be able to bring back the remainder of their employees. And so that's, a, that's an important, uh, important point, uh, particularly when we, we, you know, we keep in mind the social cost of unemployment and the long-term, the long-term health costs and the impacts on on people's careers and their their ability to get back to work. So I mentioned the uncertainty that we're facing, um, and so what we're what we're doing right now is building up a set of assumptions on possible paths of recovery, if you will. And the top chart here is showing our assumptions around tourism and. We are, right now, we're working on a pure assumption that there will begin to be some tourism in the fourth week of July. I can't show you that here because it's not weekly, it's monthly, but this, so in the baseline, we're assuming a return of visitors at the end of July of roughly 18% of last year's levels on a monthly basis. You know, if you don't think, if you think that's too optimistic, then look at our pessimistic scenario, which it, the difference is really that under the pessimistic scenario, we're basically assuming there's going to be rolling outbreaks uh, across the, the globe and across the United States and making it very, very difficult to bring back any number of, of tourists if, you know, if you ha continue to have an R greater than one across the whole, and you have rolling hotspots, right? It goes from one, um, one city to another, and so it's a much, much slower return to any kind of level of tourism. In the optimistic scenario, we start off at a higher level and build quickly. And that really is, is a, an assumption that we're going to have widespread testing capability. So, you know, th these are the unknowns. We don't have any way of, uh, of knowing whether there will be enough testi testing capacity this summer. We don't know if there will be a 
um, a significant treatment that makes the disease much less dangerous. Uh, and we certainly don't know when a vaccine will be available. All of those factors could drive a higher scenario. Then those scenarios interplay with the local economy where we assume that we begin to see opening in May at a relatively low level of activity as we begin to bring back businesses that have lower contact. Um, and then over time that builds under the baseline, we have getting back to about 70% of, of previous level of activity, right? So think about where, where we were in terms of level of activity uh, before this crisis hit. So we're talking about in a baseline, I mean, the optimistic scenario is really does require that we have testing capability and that the virus is under control and, you know, we get tourism back at a uh, level about 80%. So think about the amount of activity we had in tourism back in 2015, 2016. Um, and, you know, it's an optimistic scenario. So this is really for the purpose of discussion. And these, these are all preliminary. Uh, we will be releasing a public version of this in coming days. And we've been, we've been adjusting from taking input from actually many of the people on this call have provided us with, with input and comments. When you put the baseline scenario together with policy, uh, such as the PPP loans and the loans to airlines, you get a, first we have the 220,000 uh, job loss that's our benchmark for the bottom, and, and hopefully that is the bottom. And then you have some jobs that are being supported by the loans that are being made. Uh, not all of those loans are supporting jobs that, that will have already been lost, right? So. Uh, the financial incentives of taking out these loans uh, really suggest that many of them will be supporting workers who uh, maybe have been working fewer hours and, and the businesses have had reduced revenue. So it's really about keeping those businesses afloat. And many of them won't support uh, businesses who have already laid off workers. Uh, in our assumptions, we get about half of uh, the supported jobs back in the form of uh, reducing unemployment. And then notice we get a drop off in jobs. That's about a 30,000 uh, person decline in work after the expiration of these loans uh, because we haven't had a, sort of a sufficient opening of the local economy and, and no opening of tourism until the end of the month. And so then we begin to gradually rebuild. And by the end of the year under the baseline, uh, we still have an unemployment rate that's in the, in the high double high double digits, well, not high double digits, excuse me. Um, it's, it's about half where it is today. So in the baseline, our unemployment rate is still uh, between 15 and 17%. Uh, so it's, it's, not a, it's, it's still a, a very dire situation. Uh, in the high scenario, it's, it's much lower. Um, and the pessimistic is, is downright depressing. Um, when you put this all together on the tourism side, just to give you an idea. So we take those assumptions and we build them into, we, we put them into our model for identifying the bottom and then the, the initial recovery. And notice that we don't get anywhere near a complete recovery to the previous peak. It's really, as I was saying earlier, back to sort of 2014, 2015 levels. And that's from a combined, uh, a whole, whole variety of factors are coming into play there from um, people's willingness to travel, the overall macroeconomic uh, affects the, you know, the job destruction and the wealth destruction um, for households globally uh, that will make it more difficult for them to travel. And it's also, this is spending, so this is real spending in real dollars. So it also reflects the fact that, that uh, much of this renewed tourism activity, whenever it happens, will be done at lower prices than it was, uh, than was true in, in 2019. And so when you throw it all into our forecast model, all of these assumptions, uh, it generates a very large, near 15% drop in, in employment in 2020, um, a sharp recovery in 2021, and a near complete job recovery by the end of 2023. It, it's, not, it's not complete, just like the tourism recovery isn't. Uh, the good news is that the policy is working, right? The income support, so the drop in income is, is roughly a third of the drop in employment. And income will normally fall less. If you go back and look at the Great Recession, we had a, 
uh, a similar similar type behavior. Uh, here we're getting the support that we're talking about are the the unemployment benefits, the expanded unemployment benefits, the direct payments to households. Uh, all of that is built into the model. The PPP loans are built in. Um, we're probably missing about a billion dollars still in direct support to uh, to the state. And so these numbers will change again as we're able to in incorporate those into the into the model as well. So to, to end on sort of a, a more optimistic note, the you know there's a lot of opportunities that are arising here um, for thinking about what we you know what we want Hawaii to look like and, and what we want our economy to look like going forward. And as I said, uh, Jim Mack and Frank Haas released a a blog on on our website on Wednesday, I think it was, uh, that talks about really refocusing Hawaii tourism, asking the question, what kind of tourism do we want? How do we develop a smart tourism that uses technology? You know, just like technology has allowed for a surge in the number of visitors to the state, uh, mostly via the short-term vacation rentals uh, that have sort of lowered the cost, the technology has sort of lowered the cost of, of tourism overall, we need to be using technology to manage our tourism and, and to make sure that, you know, we have an opportunity here, not only because we need to be able to track visitors uh, while they're here for dealing with uh, health issues, but we also need to be using technology to uh, reduce overcrowding and to manage that, that, visitor, uh, that visitor experience uh, and to really have it work for, for Hawaii. The, there's some real opportunities for developing sort of a jobs core, right? I mean, there's, if we still have 100,000 people out of work at the end of this year, uh, there's going to be a necessity for programs, both job programs and education programs. So our university, our community colleges um, are going to be crucial for retraining, but also uh, being open so that high school graduates who don't have jobs and maybe aren't able or interested in traveling to the mainland, uh, so they have an opportunity to, to build their, their education and to make themselves uh, employable in the future rather than just remaining unemployed. The possibility, uh, something that's dear to my heart is investing in really 21st century data gathering and mostly open data platforms where possible for all state agencies uh, so that for the next crisis, we're in a much better situation. And so we, we're much better informed about uh, prospects and the economy and we can use that data to drive decision making. The, obviously we're going to be, have to invest in public health. And when I, you know, when I talk about these investments, there's federal money that is available in most of these cases and how we use it will, will determine what our future looks like. Uh, a robust public health system that, that provides uh, the support that we need for families, you know, the Alice families and, and all families that are going through, going through this crisis and preparing for the next crisis is crucial. And obviously, you know, we don't have the infrastructure bill yet out of Congress. Uh, we're, I mean, I'm reasonably certain we will see that. And how we spend that money, uh, obviously, we need to continue to repair roads and things like that. But we also need to be addressing climate change, uh, adapting, uh, preparing for that, ad addressing the need for additional renewable energy, and clearly investing in infrastructure that allows us to provide housing and affordable housing uh, in a in a much faster, uh, more cost effective way. So th some interesting opportunities. Many of the opportunities that will arise, no one has thought of. We don't we don't know what they are. Um, you know, so you you can clearly imagine that that uh, work going forward is going to be different, and that there's going to be good job opportunities in in information technology and cybersecurity and things like that. But some of these will be areas we just haven't thought of. And one of the really interesting pieces is that there's a, a large body of academic research on economic development that tells us that big cities where you've got a lot of people interacting uh, have driven economic 
growth for the country as a whole and have driven living standards at all levels, despite the income inequality, uh, big cities have, have played an oversized role. And that's probably going to be changing. We don't know how much it's going to change, but attitudes about density um, are certainly going to change. And there's going to be opportunities for rural Hawaii, um, but also urban, uh, urban Hawaii uh, because of the, the reduced density and because we've done a good job so far managing this crisis in terms of uh, bringing the virus under control. So we are going to be an attractive place for people to be. Uh, the cost of telework, the cost of being remote is declining every day as attitudes about it change. And so there's some, some real opportunities there. And uh, that's all I have, mahalo. And I, I look forward to, to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Um, I'm going to just start to go through. We've had several questions around the economy as it um, relates to tourism. So I'm just going to ask some of the questions that were submitted ahead of time. And again, for those of you online, feel free to put your questions in the chat box and I'll get to as many of them as we possibly can. Um, so my first question, Carl, is what level of numbers, so first of all, before I ask that question, I'm going to preface that by saying that um, there was a comment to this question that says, we can already see the improvements to the environment with fewer people moving around the state, um, which is enlightening. So what is the level of tourism that we need to see Hawaii get back to a more stable economic environment so that we can balance both environment and economic recovery? Great question. Um, so one thing to keep in mind is that the, you know, what tourism looks like and how we manage it is, is a question for our society. Um, and, you know, we, we really have to think about what we want uh, tourism to look like going forward. And, you know, what that level is, uh, is highly dependent on how we manage it. So if we go right back to, you know, business as usual, and this was something that, that uh, Jim Mack and Frank Haas mentioned in, in their blog. If we, you know, go back to, you know, let's maximize the number of people here with very little policy making and, and, and insufficient uh, resources being devoted to protecting the environment, then we'll get what we used to have. Um, if we focus on high value added um, high spending visitors, not necessarily trying to get back to a, you know, a, a number that's in the 10 million range and make sure that those, uh, you know, environmentally conscious, uh, higher spending visitors are contributing to maintaining and, and, you know, covering some of the costs that, that they're bringing to bear on, on our natural environment, whether it's at Hanama Bay or, uh, an example that Jim and Frank gave was right now we only charge a dollar to uh, hike up to the top of Diamond Head. Now that's not a pristine environmental <laughs> location, obviously, but it's way overcrowded and clearly many visitors be, would, be, we would be willing to pay much more than a dollar and that money could be used to maintain the facility. And that goes for our hiking trails, our, our, uh, our beaches, um, if you think about the, you know, just the surge in the number of people that we've seen that you can attribute primarily to technology and uh, short-term vacation rentals, um, you know, going back to levels of activity of 2015 to 2016, but seeing a higher paying visitor is, is certainly feasible. And when we, when we first started looking at what the implications were of a shutdown of a potential shutdown, the policy changes that would, um, we assumed that would eventually shut down all short-term vacation rentals on Oahu that weren't in a uh, resort zone. While we found a reduced number of visitors, uh, our models, and take them with a huge grain of salt because they're just forecast models 
uh, they actually predicted that spending would end up being about the same, but we'd have fewer visitors. Again, in line with the um, issues around tourism, the question is, is the state economy forever tied to tourism as our leading industry? Or are there other industries or sectors, opportunities such as manufacturing, agriculture, biomedical research, IT, financial services, whose growth would create jobs and allow Hawaii to be less reliant on visitor arrivals and more self-sufficient? So the, the, the short answer is yes, there are these other, other industries are, um, they're not really potential in terms of replacing tourism. So, so the key thing that you, you have to realize is that um, we, in order for our standard of living to, to be supported, and I, re, and I realize that, that um, I mean, there's a big, a very, very important uh, element of income inequality here that has to be, has to be dealt with uh, both through, through state policy, particularly tax policy and, and, and other forms of policy, education, et cetera. Uh, but in order to support a robust standard of living, we really need to, and from a financial perspective, we need to have an export industry. Um, so over time, if we're going to grow the, pie for every person, um, what's involved is you, you have to make things that you sell to the rest of the world. And so to the extent that uh, we're able to use high tech manufacturing and sell things, I mean, actually a, a great example, at least for my preferences, is uh, Maui Brewing Company uh, that started off as a, as a small local manufacturer. Right? They, they manufacture beer and now they sell it to the entire world. And it's also intimately tied with tourism because many of the people who are buying that beer all around the world now originally bought it when they were here in Hawaii. Uh, so the short answer is yes, those industries do exist. They're very, very small, right? So if you look at the number of jobs in manufacturing, the number of, of jobs in, in ag um, compared to what exists today in hospitality and tourism, they're very small. One of the more promising areas is, is uh, really research and development and in the high tech area. And if you look at what's happened uh, in Hawaii over the last 15 years, there's really been a surge in, uh, in activity of entrepreneurial activity and uh, efforts by, by whether it's um, you know, startups, accelerators, um, uh, community organizations to support this. And, you know, we now have accelerators operating on every island and it's, you know, it's not just in high tech, it's, it's in areas including uh, moving making, um, in food service, all kinds of areas. And really that entrepreneurial piece is, is key, right? So there, we have to be thinking about at every business opportunity, how do I take this and make it something where not only can I serve my local community, but I can also start to produce something that I'm selling to the rest of the world, whether it's a, a beer or Aloha shirts or, um, or software. Yeah, the next question, one more for you, um, Carl. <laughs> How do you think real estate values fare, hmm. residential, resort, as well as commercial? That's a, that's a great question. And um, to be honest, I'm not going to speculate on that because we, I, I, we haven't given that a lot of, uh, a lot of thought. Uh, the, actually, I will speculate a little bit. So we normally, when we look at real estate values, usually we're focused on, on housing. Um, the, but clearly, if, if you have a lower level of business activity, so I mean, obviously, if, if a year from now we're at 80% or 85% or of our current level of activity and uh, there's a, an increase in, in you know, work from home and social distancing, uh, there's going to be a reduced level of demand for office space. There's going to be a reduced level of demand for, for uh, many types of commercial space. Uh, the you know, resort, resort areas will be very, very dependent uh, clearly on whether or not we have tourism recover to a level 
that's sufficient for um, for hoteliers and uh, all of the tourism, the hospitality and tourism industry to to actually make money, right? So if you know if we look at a a level of tourism that's uh, 40, 50 percent of our previous previous highs, there, you know, unless the company has absolutely no debt, even if a company has absolutely no debt, um, they're unlikely to be able to cover costs at, at anywhere near that level of activity. So you think about a hotel that's operating at 40, 50% occupancy rate, that we can't do that in Hawaii. Um, you know, that's like an airport hotel on the mainland. Uh, so the, you know, the values of those, uh, of those commercial properties will depend on on what the future looks like for their ability to make revenue. Thank you. Micah, um, I'm gonna throw this next question to you. This is specifically about um, the Hawaii Community Foundation. Um, with all of the events that are happening and the great need in community, will the Community Foundation develop a roadmap to help philanthropists measure COVID needs against the needs of organizations that they normally support? And how can we at the Community Foundation perhaps help them to determine how to support both? You know, Pre-COVID, as many of you folks know, we uh, developed a framework called the CHANGE Framework. Uh, it's an acronym for six sectors, community economy, health and wellness, arts and culture, natural environment, government and civic engagement, and education. And there were 64 indicators that rolled up to help us understand the well-being of people in place in our community. Um, so going into COVID, I think we had a pretty clear understanding of where the outlier data set, data uh, issues were that guided us in uh, making recommendations to our donors and our partners where the greatest impact could be made. When COVID hit, um, all we saw was an exacerbation of those data sets. Um, those most vulnerable were um, hit the hardest. Those who were Alice uh, or were on the fringe of Alice, you know, solidified their position in Alice. And so, you know, clearly uh, we felt that we were onto something uh, when we saw those numbers. Um, and many of those numbers are being proven out through Carl's um, presentations um, that we've seen be before this one. And so, you know, the roadmap for us is there. Uh, we will definitely continue to um, increase that information into our data set, but um, we feel very confident about being able to help our, our partners and our donors going forward during COVID and post-COVID. Thank you, Micah. Carl, another question for you. With COVID-19 cases on the decline, why do we continue to shut down the entire island and cause the unprecedented economic hardship? How important is it to stay shut down based on that economic hardship? So that's a great question that, that uh, many of us are, are talking about every single day. The, the work that's being done by the uh, various committees that have been set up and the task forces, uh, essentially we are in the process of developing plans for how to reopen. And those plans depend on a set of metrics uh, and one of them you just mentioned, the number of new cases, right? So there, there has to be a sustained decline in the number of new cases. There has to be ha hospital capacity uh, to deal with any, any increase in, in new cases. And we have to have the testing and contact tracing and isolation capacity. And, you know, I'm, I'm not the uh, health expert here, uh, but I think we're very, very close to reopening the the those are just the health conditions right then the next thing is are the businesses ready to reopen so uh, let's say we allow so for example uh, the mayor's order says that car dealers can reopen in some capacity so do they have all of the cleaning materials they have do they have the ppe that they require and and you know do we have a set of guidelines i think the the restaurant association, I'm, that of the food industry association, I don't recall which, came out with some of their guidelines yesterday. So uh, I, I think we're very close to being to being able to reopen, uh, but there are still steps that have to be put in place. And not only do you have to have enough testing and, and tracing capacity for where we are today, 
but you have to have the, the capacity to respond very, very quickly to any new outbreaks, right? So uh, when we begin to open up, then our social distancing will be changing. <clears throat> And presumably there will be some new cases. Uh, so until the virus is, is completely killed off in the state, um, we will have new outbreaks. And will we be able to, do we have the capacity to very, very quickly identify the source and contact every single person that, you know, that has been in touch with, you know, been in contact with, with the infected people and test the ones that have symptoms or even the ones that don't have symptoms. So that capacity all has to be in place. Um, obviously, so the, the key going forward is we have to balance the risk. First, we have to have the ability to manage the risk. We have to have all of the infrastructure in place at DOH. Um, and then we have to balance the risk of an outbreak and manage it against the risk that we're imposing on households and businesses, right? And the, there's a social cost, there's a health cost uh, to staying at home and being without, without work. And that cost is, is not by any stretch negligible and it has to be balanced against the risk that some of us in our Kapuna uh, catch this virus. Thank you, Carl. And just, um, I apologize for using acronyms that not everyone uh, may be aware of, but just as a reminder, um, when we're talking about ALICE, um, the ALICE is the acronym for Asset Limited Income Constrained Employed. So essentially, when we are talking about ALICE families, we're referring to working class families who although they're working, their income levels are still such that they have very little savings and that they're essentially living uh, paycheck paycheck. Um, working poor essentially is what we're referring to when we talk about Alice, um, as has been talked about in great through a report that was originally commissioned um, by Aloha United Way, supported by both the Community Foundation and Bank of Hawaii and Kamehameha Schools. Um, we're at our five minute mark. We have about five minutes left. And so I'd like to turn this over to Micah um, for some closing comments and to get us wrapped up for today. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, I really want to thank uh, Carl for, for stepping up and, and doing this for us, but I also want to thank you for the leadership you're showing in our community car. It's great to see the university out there front and center. You know, myself, along with many of my board members, are on so many uh, different calls, and, and you're out there uh, putting the university forward, and uh, that's the kind of leadership, you know, we want to see out there. So thank you for that. I also want to thank uh, everyone who's joined us on this uh, Zoom call. Uh, appreciate you folks taking the time. I want to again thank you for the support you're giving us. Um, our, our team has the privilege of, of being on the front line and seeing the need out there. So please stay with us and we're going to make sure that um, we put those resources to work. Uh, on, on, May on May 15th um, at 1030, Ron Mizutani is going to be joining us. Um, we hope you'll join us. An email will be in the box. He's out there working hard as one of the um, first responder leaders out there. You saw on the news last night some of the work that um, a partnership was uh, put forward with Bank of Hawaii, uh, HCF, as well as the city. Um, you see the need out there. We appreciate you folks being with us. Have a great weekend. Mahalo everyone.